Good day, Stephanie. First of all, let me thank you for agreeing to do this video interview with me today over Zoom. And thank you for asking. It's my pleasure. We haven't seen each other in 20 plus years, I'm guessing. Um, that sounds about right. ISBI conferences a long time ago, but uh, um, again, thank you for uh, agreeing to do this with me. For our audience, could you please introduce yourself and uh, tell us where you grew up? Uh, my name is Stephanie Jackson. I grew up in uh, a little a large town in New Hampshire, uh, just south of Dartmouth College. Thank you. So uh, where did you go to college and what did you study? <laughs> I went to Cornell University, got a degree in English, despite the fact that my father said I knew how to speak it already. Uh, and then proceeded to go on and get a master's degree in English and teach for a couple of years and looked around and said, how did I get in this position? <laughs> and isn't there something better I can do? Uh, I see. And, uh, and it was at the end of your educational uh, pursuits or did, and did you go to work then after that? What, where did uh, you? No, uh, after a, the second year of teaching, I took a summer course at uh, Dartmouth which was not accepting women at that time, but you could take summer courses. Uh, and uh, it was heavily on Skinner and Freud. And I was obviously fascinated by Skinner, uh, somewhat entertained by Freud. And uh, at the end of the course, the professor said, you seem to have a feel for this. Would you like to go on? Well, yes, I really wanted to go on, but how are you gonna get into graduate school that?" <laughs> all that English background and zilch and psychology. So he got me a job with, uh, as research assistant to the chairman of the Department of Psychology. The chairman let me take courses with the Dartmouth students, which I would not be credited with, but if I did a good job, they would uh, give me a background to get into graduate school. So somebody knew someone who was chairman of the Department of Psychology at uh, University of Delaware, and they got me in. Uh, and on from there. And so uh, can, you, can you give us a little bit about your career progression and what kinds of jobs that you had kind of leading up to your retirement? The first job actually, uh, out of the University of Delaware was with an outfit called Associates for Research and Behavior. And it was a market research firm that was behavior-based. You didn't ask people questions, you watched what they did. Uh, in fact, just very quickly, uh, we did a study on a, a product where they simply wanted to decide which was the best name for it. So we put sample products out with the different names they wanted and saw what people bought. So that's how Pampers came to get its name. <laughs> uh, uh, and since I wasn't significantly interested in doing a lot more market research, the company um, asked me to write a grant for a training and development program for women on welfare. And I did that with the help of one of the associates. It was, uh, it was the first thing that taught me is you really need to pay attention to the environment because these folks, most of them had either never had jobs or had had jobs only in what? Very low level situations. They'd never been in an office before in any work position. So we arranged with uh, a few local businesses to take people who were near graduation on for a week or two and let them see what it was like to work in an office. And then when they went to get a job, uh, those folks could potentially recommend them. Uh, worked out very well. And we started having parties and inviting the graduates. And that built another thing they needed for the, uh, in the environment, which is some confidence. They saw these people coming back uh, saying, hey, I have a job. I have a checking account. Uh, so that's, uh, 
that's where I met Donald Bullock. He was a friend of the, uh, the owner of the business. And uh, he convinced me that I should be going to uh, Catholic University and maybe taking some more courses and maybe doing a little coaching. And shortly thereafter, he said, you know, Joe Harless is looking for someone. And then I hit the jackpot. I still- Joe Harless. Yes, I still remember sitting at my desk on the first, in the first week and reading some of his stuff and saying, wow, somebody really knows how to do this. So I, uh, I floated around the country with various companies. I worked with Joe for a number of years, heavily on uh, projects for AT&T, job aids, training programs. Uh, and then um, I went to a conference and met Don Toasty and Bob Carlton, who had a little firm in California. And uh, after a while, they invited me out to join them. So I became a member of operants. Year or so later, the Forum Corporation bought operants and I moved back to Boston. Uh, and finally, let's see, where do we go from there? Oh, I became an independent consultant for a little while. And that at, at about that time, this would have been in the 60s. No, oh, this is uh, well, into the, well into the 70s. Uh, there was a huge project with British Airways going from being government subsidized to having to make a profit. And I was one of a huge horde of consultants and firms that worked on it. Um, but we worked heavily with uh, training supervisors, mid-level managers about how they need to manage in the, in the new environment. And uh, we also helped participate in changing what they measured. They measured safety and on-time departure and arrival. And somebody decided to add customer satisfaction to that. Uh, and the thing we needed to work on during the training program and in the environment was relationships across uh, departments, because while they were measuring safety and uh, on-time arrival and departure, they, if there was a problem, they brought a committee together of the groups that could potentially know about or have contributed to the problem. And I think there were 15 points. At any rate, they had points and you assigned each department points depending on how much they contributed to the problem. It was casually known as the blame committee. But what that did, of course, was it created relationships among departments that were not great. So um, when we started doing training development with, uh, we brought people from various departments. In other words, we never did training for the uh, stewardesses or the baggage handlers or whatever it was, you had training with people from departments across the company. Um, we had teamwork uh, projects and those were always done with people from other departments. Um, and we even in one, in one program where it was, things were really uh, a little antsy, uh, we gave people an opportunity to ask other departments how they saw them with, with the specification that whatever they said had to be done very respectfully and politely. But over time, by bringing those groups together and having them learn about each other's work, uh, we really built some good relationships across departments and people were, it was really, they were really pleased to find or, so that was uh, that was my first big project with, uh, and then we kept going. Uh, Forum Corporation bought operants. Uh, 
that was with Don Tosti and was uh, Bob Carlton a part of that right. as well? Right. One of the things that happens happened with British Airways is that's where Vanguard Consulting Group was formed. Ah, okay. That was uh, Don and Bob and there, there were a whole bunch. There were a whole bunch of us, and uh, I think we did. I think we did this decision making in a pub. Anyway, uh, <laughs> we, <laughs> we put, pulled together a firm that was Don Toasty, Bob Carlton, Claude Lineberry, who by then had had uh, left uh, Joe, uh, mm -hmm. myself, Bob Powers, and a couple of people in the UK. So for a period of time, we had uh, a UK office. And uh, Vanguard lasted until uh, about 2000 something. But uh, Bob and Claude went off and formed Vector at some point. There was a lot of movement. People were bouncing around, forming, <laughs> forming different groups, coming mm -hmm. back together, uh, made for an interesting time. But one of the things I loved about this business is the opportunity to uh, meet so many different kinds of people and so many different kinds of businesses. I mean, where else would you get to train people in prison and uh, talk to executives at AT&T? And it's, it's one of the things that makes the, the business fascinating. So then you retired, what, 15 years ago or so? Is, is that what you were telling uh, me before? About, about 15 years ago, uh, I was, I moved back to New Hampshire from California mm -hmm. in 2000 to support my mother. And I worked from home <laughs> doing, doing interviews and supporting Don in California for a period of time. So sometime between 2000 and 2005, uh, we ended Vanguard. Mm -hmm. And now you work uh, supporting uh, local uh, uh, social service agencies and such, is that right? Yeah, I do, well, I do volunteer work with uh, historical societies, the library, uh, various other associations. And I used my uh, knowledge from behavioral psychology and performance technology to foster dogs from rescue. Mm -hmm. You can do a really good job with them. <laughs> very, very interesting. Thank you. Can you share with us a little bit about your first exposure to performance technology or human performance technology? What, who, who was it and uh, what, what kinds of books or articles did uh, did you read uh, to you know, get more into all of that? Well, I read almost everything by Skinner. Mm -hmm. uh, I read and loved Joe's Ounce of Analysis. Uh, I read Tom Gilbert. Um, I, think, I think those are the, the main things. I read lots of articles in uh, ISPI Journal and went to conferences and that sort of thing. But those were kind of, for me, the foundation. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And they're, they're, they're a part of the history. Everybody should know them. And they're not part of the history in that they're things past. They're part of the history in that they have the basis mm -hmm. for performance yeah. technology. Yeah, it's the foundation. I, I agree. I think that the, the work that uh, Skinner did and Gilbert did and Harless and all the people that kind of came after them. And of course, there were other people in parallel development efforts, Breathauer and Rumler. And yes, yes. Uh, you could go on and name uh, name names for another half hour uh, before you'd exhaust them. But yeah, but they were all standing on the base of, of those guys. There is yeah. one thing. I wish somebody could figure out a way to get rid of Skinner's uh, reinforcement versus punishment, positive and negative reinforcement, positive and negative punishment. Mm -hmm. Punishment is a bad word and people have difficulty with it, I think. But yeah, I, tend to it, reject it, that. I, we, we can't get after Skinner, it's too late for that. <laughs> True. It would be nice if we talked about maybe encouragement and discouragement. Mm -hmm. 
might be. Better terms, less harsh. Yes, it's hard to explain to somebody what Skinner meant by positive punishment and negative punishment. So uh, you've named uh, your first uh, exposure to that. I guess it would have been Don Bullock because I remember him from 1980 when I went to my first conference and he was very active for a number of years there. Yes. Um, is he the one who introduced you to NSPI uh, besides Joe Harless or was it Joe that did that? Um, he, Donald introduced me kind of to NSPI and Joe Harless almost at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, he loved that society. No. Yeah, he was a great contributor. He was one of the first people that I know of there. I'm sure there were many more that, that took uh, Gilbert's behavior engineering model and uh, adapted it in certain ways. And I can't remember the specifics of that, but I remember seeing that. And of course, many others have, have done that. Roger Chevalier has done that and Carl Binder has done that. Uh, uh, but they they didn't change the structure of it. They just changed some of the language that was used uh, because of uh, uh, the inaccessibility, I think, of some of the language that Gilbert used. Yeah, he's a little tougher read than. <laughs> than I was Joe. given I was given Gilbert's book Human Competence on my very first day at work after I graduated from college, and I was wow. at in Mager's and Pipe's book on analyzing performance problems. I was given a. A, a 1970 newsletter, this was 1979, but a, a 1970 newsletter from the Praxis organization, so Gilbert and Rumler. And it took me a number of months to get through Tom Gilbert's book because it was not an easy read um, for, for me. But uh, it, it is a classic and uh, I do go back and look at it every once in a while um, for inspiration. Can, let me shift gears here a little bit. So. Um, if you were to give us a 30 second elevator speech, either about what you do now with, with your volunteering or, or what you did uh, back before you retired, I'm trying to provide examples to our audience for, you know, what does a succinct elevator speech, you know, sound like? Do you have something you can share with us? <laughs> you just want a succinct elevator speech or you want it to actually have <laughs> Well, uh, you, if you only have one floor, so, you know, 30 seconds or so, what, how, how would you explain uh, what it is that you, you did during your career? What, you know, if you were at a neighborhood party and there's a new neighbor and they don't know you and they ask you, so what did you used to do? Uh -huh. Aha. <laughs> I used to work with uh, organizations that had to change the way they, uh, uh, change the way they performed frequently uh, with organize, well, two kinds of things. Uh, part of the work was developing training and developing job aids and that sort of thing as people brought new products or new systems online. Uh, the other part that I found most interesting was working with organizations that had to change the way they do business, uh, like British Airways, for example, when uh, they became private, uh, uh, like uh, oh, who was it? Oh, banks. We did a lot of work with banks. Mm -hmm. These banks became deregulated. Yeah, um, and you couldn't sit back in your chair and wait for people to come beg for loans. You had to figure a way to uh, the word sell was anathema in banks for a while. It yeah. was really hard for them to say, we have to sell. Um, so we said, no, you have to present. <laughs> mm -hmm. So what kind of target audiences did you work with at the bank? Was it uh, uh, management? Was it out at the branches? Um, uh, mostly, mostly management. Okay. I, an enormous amount of the training that I wrote and delivered was management training. Mm -hmm. mid-level management okay which is where it happens yeah excellent thank you well let me shift gears again a little bit here um uh, i'm imagining that you're still a lifelong learner and are there are there things that you're you're focused on for learning nowadays given your volunteer work um uh, well 
I'm learning how towns are managed because I'm working with uh, volunteer groups in the town library. Uh, the town I live in runs a huge fair to which thousands come. Mm -hmm. And uh, I run a book sale to which thousands of books come. And they, in turn, uh, the money from that supports many activities in the in the community. So I'm learning how to work with a really wide variety of people in a one on one. Yeah, there's other volunteers, I'm, I'm guessing, and the uh, politicians of the town and such. Yeah, exactly. There are tons, tons of other volunteers. There are politicians, some of whom are enormously supportive. Uh, some of whom are uh, not so supportive. Mm -hmm. Well, excellent. So my next question is about language terminology in the field. And uh, it's, it's been an issue. I remember hearing uh, Joe Harless lament about the inconsistency in our language back in the mid eighties uh, after I first got involved with NSBI. But is there a performance improvement term or phrase that you would define for us, perhaps you feel that it's it's being misused or misconstrued by others, and you want to put your own spin on it. What uh, what term or or phrase would you share with us? I'm not sure there is one other than the one I mentioned: uh, reinforcement versus punishment. Okay. I really think punishment should be wiped out of the language. Uh, it's too often seen as uh, making someone miserable, mm -hmm. doing harm to them, that sort of thing. Uh, so if there's a way that we could talk about reinforcing, encouraging behavior versus discouraging behavior or performance. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I think punishment, uh, I, I use the term occasionally myself, and I always get a negative reaction from people about that. But um, because I always think of the, the consequence system as I first l learned about it or heard about it from the perspective of Gary Rumler, he would always talk about the consequences that uh, drive behavior. And uh, um, but but that's always tricky to to talk with people about that because it's, it's it is it's it is negative. It sounds negative, and so yeah. people resist that. And even with the consequences, people aren't always clear that they're. Uh, you can encourage behavior both by making something nice happen for the person, mm -hmm. money, praise, whatever it is, or by taking away something that is bothering them in some sense. Yeah. Uh -uh. So more carrot and less stick. Well, if we can, let's go back and, and talk about uh, some of the people from the past that you've worked with or associated with uh, at NSPI. Um, and do you have any interesting stories that you can tell us about either projects or just their personality and quirkiness or, or whatever? Um, who, 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 who can you tell us a little bit about? Well, with Joe, Joe was wonderful to work for, mm -hmm. or at least I thought so. Uh, but very seldom did I work with him. He threw a project at you. <laughs> and you marched out and, and did it. Mm -hmm. If, I don't know that I ever actually got stuck on one, but you know, he would provide support if, if needed. Uh -huh. um, so what were the key things that you learned from, uh, from working with Joe? I think, um, well, front end analysis mm -hmm. was one of one of the things that I found most valuable. Um, and I did a number of projects in which there was an upfront analysis. I prepared my report. We went on from there. Um, Can you share with us a little bit about uh, what you did and what you documented when you guys did front end analysis back then? Hmm. What we documented? Yeah. 
where you focused on the worthy outputs, as Gilbert called them, and uh, and tasks and behaviors, both uh, physical and cognitive, or or yeah, behavior, phys physical, physical environment, mm -hmm. uh, working relationships. Okay, those those were I thought very important. Uh, consequences of behavior mm -hmm. or lack thereof. Yeah. Uh, which was often more of a problem than <laughs> mm. actually having consequences. Uh, so what, what can you tell us about uh, the late Bob Carlton and working with him? It's interesting. I didn't work directly with Bob. Oh, okay. We were in business together. Mm -hmm. uh, we made decisions about uh, what projects we were going to take on, uh, general joint decisions about uh, how we wanted to approach them. But uh, otherwise, he was a friendly guy you could have beer with. <laughs> yeah. It, well, what, it, what, it uh, did work. So, so I, when I was uh, president of, of uh, ISPI, uh, Don Toasty was the president elect. So I spent uh, many a day in the board meetings with him and afterwards out to dinner and such. And I always thought he was such a fascinating person. But uh, so what, what are some of the more interesting things that you did with Don? Let's see. Uh, well, British Airways was, right. was, was one of them. Uh, we did a, we did a project for Hewlett Packard. Actually, that I, now that I started that, it's not going to be quite what I did with Don. Uh, Hewlett Packard was concerned as their business grew that uh, the HP way might be not necessarily disappearing, but not not what it had been. It was kind of um, so they hired uh, Don and I and uh, a couple of consultants from McKinsey, one of whom had uh, written a book on culture, I think. So we got together and we talked about how, uh, how we were going to approach the business. And uh, Don talked about measuring culture. And the one of the McKinsey persons announced that you couldn't measure culture, for heaven's sakes. <laughs> The, res the result of which was Don and he departed and the other guy and I finished the project <laughs> measuring the behavior, <laughs> cultural behavior. Uh, so I, I'm sorry I got you started on that, but it, it, made, for an in it made for a very interesting project. Uh, yes, I remember hearing about the HP way and it was really the, the, something that I think the founders had kind of established in their Yes, community. yes, it was. A, so it can, was, for our audience, do you, can you tell us what the HP way basically was? Uh, it was, it was a, it was focused on, well, one, a quality, quality product, uh, respectful uh, treatment of each other, uh, kind of a set of values, honesty, respectfulness, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, it made, uh, it was built into working relationships in the department. So it, it made for a good cross uh, organizational set of working relationships, as well as people being able to feel good about their products. Yeah. And they did pretty well with that, although I'm told that some years later, uh, when Carly Fiorina took over, it, yeah, it leadership can uh, support or damage cultural issues. That was, uh, I, I, I had, HP was my client back in the uh, late 80s, and early 90s. And and I remember some of the people on my projects uh, talking about the HP way and, and, you know, everybody was fearful as the organization grew and faced different challenges, perhaps that they hadn't faced previously. They were worried that that was going to go away, that there was a, uh, 
Um, it, it wasn't the same old place uh, to many of them that had been around for a long time. And uh, it reminded me, because I'd spent a, a, a year and a half working at Motorola, and Motorola had a similar kind of a culture too. It was very kind of almost family values and everybody treated each other a certain way. And uh, I'm, I'm not sure that that lasted forever for Motorola, but uh, that, that's interesting. So what, so who about some of the other people from, from NSPI, you were, you were president of the society. So who was on your board? Uh, who did you work with? Uh, let's see, Kathleen Whiteside. Yeah, Kathleen Whiteside, Danny Langdon's uh, wife. Yep. Uh, it's all. <laughs> <laughs> Well, when was this that you were that you were the president? Uh, 80s or the 80s? 80s. Uh huh. Um, yeah, it was, it was in the it was in the 80s. When did Donald Bullock die? I remember giving. I I don't remember exactly when that happened. Um, I remember being asked to give a. A talk on him at the beginning uh -huh. of the conference. Uh -huh. Yeah, that was that. I I don't I can't pin down a date here. Yeah. I just remember seeing him in his wheelchair at the conferences, and uh, yes, I didn't, I didn't know him personally. I knew of him, and I'm not sure he knew of me. But uh, I was rather new to the society when when I sensed that he was most active. Yeah, he was up. He was out front there in his wheelchair every yeah. single conference. Yeah. In fact, I remember saying when I talked, had to talk about his death that the way to honor him best was to have a really good time at the conference. Mm -hmm. He loved it. And, uh, Those conferences were, were amazing experiences. What are some of your favorite memories of uh, NSPI and the people and conferences and committees and all of that? Let's see. <laughs> I'm not sure I want to tell you all these. <laughs> I know there's a lot of non PG stories from the day, but I, we don't have to go there. But <laughs> it was always fun to run into Joe Harless. Mm -hmm. uh, who, I can remember one conference in which we we spent quite a bit of time together. This is well after I'd stopped working with him. And I had helped him with a book, and I can't even remember what book I was, it was that I worked on with him. But uh, he wrote me a nice note uh, saying he hoped we could work again sometime in the future, and then said, remember our lifelong agreement. You do all the work, I get all the money. <laughs> that sounds like Joe. Yes, it does. So, so it? it was the uh, uh, Eden book about uh, the educational system, or was his... his no, it was, no, it was something... Uh, was something much earlier than that. Oh, okay, okay, huh? I I know people uh, ask me where can they get you know some of the early Harless books like An Ounce of Analysis is worth a pound of objectives and uh, he gave me he said he told me when he gave it to me he said this is my very last copy other than my personal copy um, and he made me promise that uh, two things that uh, I would not allow anybody to republish that and he would never explain to me why and he also made me promise that that when he passed away that that I would not allow the society to hold a memorial service for him um, he had come back out of retirement for Claude Lineberry's memorial service at ISPI. This was in 2003 or four. I was right. I remember I could president or what had, was just ending my term. And so I was there for that service for Claude and, and Joe was just very upset. There were people who pretended that they were Claude's best friend and he knew that they weren't and it upset him so much. And because the two of them were fraternity brothers, as I'm sure you well know. Yeah. Um, he was just offended by that. And so he didn't want them to do that for that. So, so when he passed in 2012, I remember I reached out to the, the, to the elected leaders of ISPI and said, now, wait a minute, now he's prom made me promise. So I don't want him to come back after me. Haunt you. On. <laughs> and please don't hold one of those. 
so then they asked me if I would uh, kind of uh, uh, help put together a, a tribute to him in uh, the performance improvement journal, uh, which I did. But um, yeah, he was a he was quite a character. He was gruff, but but gentle. He was a gruff teddy bear. Um, I, I remember he, overhearing him say to people as they approached him, he would say, "Well, do you have any money?" <laughs> And then, and then and a moment later, he would say, well, tell me what you need. I'll help you. Intimidating. Yeah, actually, you can get some of those books on Amazon. Mm -hmm. I'll have to go back and, and look and see what. Uh, I haven't checked the ounce of analysis, but I think you might even be able to get that. Is that possible? Well, I, I think you can get them. You can find them used. Um, um, Somebody uh, uh, involved in Fred Nichols, who's involved with uh, ISPI still, um, made oh. some comment uh, on a group that we're, we are both members of that he had been on a waiting list for one of Joe's books, and he'd been waiting for years and years and years, and oh. finally he was able to purchase it. And it was not a book that I was familiar with, so I'm, I'm, uh, I don't know, it's just hard to come by, I guess classics hmm. so uh, so any other anybody else that you could did you since you work with don did you work at, at all with roger addison yes the kid yes. As a matter, the brother? As a matter of fact uh we worked uh we did a lot of work on banks when you know i said yeah wells fargo uh mm -hmm. bank of america that sort of thing that's how Roger got his job at Wells Fargo Bank. <laughs> ah, doing doing project work first, yes, huh? Yeah, doing the project. And he impressed them enough, so they offered him a job, <laughs> which I guess paid more than <laughs> we were making. Yeah, uh, it's more steady income than consultants usually. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, thank you so much for agreeing to do this video interview with me, and it's very and I'm I'm so pleased to see you again after all these years. Um, um, I I'll, I want to tell a little story here that I had asked Don Toasty if he would if he had any articles that I could publish in a quarterly newsletter. I did, and we put it on paper and sent it out to our clients, and and he said yes, and he would send me these articles, but he, uh, via email. This was in the late '90s early 2000s and uh, he said but 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 wait until Stephanie cleans it up for me and so I I would always have to wait and I would read through and it, the punctuation it was just terrible he types like I do and uh, but the, but I so I would wait and get the cleaned up version of the article from you and then I would uh, publish that in our newsletter but uh, um, yes that was the one benefit of all that time I spent uh, taking graduate work in English. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, you were quite the- I could write my own papers and help people write theirs. Yes, well, anyway, uh, I think, so I have one last question for you. Um, our, my audience uh, includes people that are, uh, have been around in the field of uh, instructional design or performance technology, uh, but, but I, I'm looking for any words of wisdom or guidance that you might have for uh, people new to the field, whether they're younger or older, but but if they're entering the field, what what would you suggest or what guidance would you have for them on on what how they should approach climbing the learning curve in instructional design and performance technology? Ooh, um, other than read those basic books, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, articles by Rumler and. Uh, Breath Hour and all those folks. Um, gee, and all the good firms I've worked with are gone. Yeah. <laughs> that would be a great, great way to start. Uh, well, yeah, I think, I think re reading and going to uh, an ISPI, mm -hmm. it, it's not only a learning experience, it's a great way to meet people. Yeah. Meet people who have, for example, jobs for newcomers. True. Uh, uh, are willing to uh, spend some time talking to them. I really think that's a good way to begin building relationships in the performance technology community. Mm -hmm. I, I agree. I, that was that was my experience, and uh, I wish 
you know, it's, it's somewhat nostalgic that uh, uh, that I look back on my experience with NSPI that became ISPI, but uh, I think it was, I, I learned a lot at conferences and through their journals and, uh, and met a lot of great people and worked on a lot of committees with them and uh, built my network before we had the internet. Now mm -hmm. it's easier, now it's different. Stephanie, thank you so much for sharing with us today. Um, I wish you well, and I hope to see you again sometime soon in the future. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.